Well, hello everyone, and welcome to this new video in which we continue our close reading of Dialectic of Enlightenment by Theodore Adorno and Max Horkheimer. Um, today we're going to jump into the second excursus. Uh, in the previous excursus, we studied the Odyssey and how it contains elements of enlightenment reason. Um, we saw how the journey of Odysseus was about neutralizing nature's powers, and in this second excursus, we uh, um, now we move to a case study that is more modern and uh, contemporary of the actual Age of Enlightenment. Here, Adorno and Horkheimer are going to analyze Juliet, uh, the novel by Le Marquis de Sade, published in uh, 1797. Um, we will get to who Marquis de Sade, uh, de Sade was, uh, but first let's review what enlightenment is. And the excursus opens with a famous definition of what is enlightenment. It quotes from the famous line of Immanuel Kant's, uh, Immanuel Kant's short essay, What is Enlightenment? Um, enlightenment, in Kant's words, is the human being's emergence from self-incured minority. Minority is inability to make use of one's own understanding without direction from another. So, minority means tutelage. When people rely on tutors instead of relying on reason and their own understanding, they are in a state of minority. So, basically, enlightenment means people learn to think by themselves instead of relying on authority figures or be guided by someone else. But thinking by yourself doesn't mean thinking in whatever way that you want. Um, it's also to think rationally. It is, not, uh, it is not that you have no guides, but rather your guide is reason with a capital R. And luckily for Kant, uh, we have reason within us. There are laws of logic that we are born with, and so our thinking must be modeled on those laws. In other words, um, enlightenment, uh, in enlightenment you become aware of the internal logic of your mind, so um, of its of its mechanisms. Like you look at your own mind, uh, like it is a watch. You understand how um, the watch ticks, and so you know how to make it work. And therefore, you apply the same to your mind. Like you, uh, like the watch obeys laws of, uh, of physics, the mind obeys laws of logic. So, um, so what do uh, so what do we do then? Is take our individual cognitions, our beliefs, experience, uh, perception, etc., and we say um, they must be aligned with the laws of logic. There you create a system where everything that you will experience will systematically, automatically fit within your internal logic. And so Kant explains this uh, in his critique of pure reason, which, uh, which the authors are going to quote a lot throughout the, uh, the excursus. Um, for Kant, reason must achieve a unity of the activities of understanding. When we understand something, it must be done so by the same system, that is, logic. This means that you will, um, that you will form a hierarchy of knowledge, meaning that you will learn to distinguish the most reliant methods of, inquir of inquiry, for example. You get to distinguish which kind of knowledge is more uh, reliable or accurate than another. Um, if you know something through logic, that scores higher than knowing through uh, simple observation or direct observation, which scores uh, higher than knowing something through cultural biases, etc. So the unity of knowledge means finding the right principle from which all forms of knowledge will derive, and as such, um, your knowledge, your system will be self-sufficient. There won't be confusion or contradiction anymore because we will have the right method to assess knowledge, to assess thoughts, perceptions, beliefs, and opinions. So we will have a good methodology to know which knowledge is true, which one is false, which one is rational, which one is delusional, which one is structured, and which one is uh, you know, without, without direction, which one is chaotic, and of course which one uh, is democratic and free, and which one is authoritarian. So religious beliefs, for example, myths, poetic intuition, metaphysics, are of the second kind. Uh, even metaphysics, because as we've explained in the first chapter, it is a rationalization of delusions. I mean, this is how uh, metaphysicians um, know they won't be taken seriously if they talk about gods and angels, and so they will refer to those using metaphysical notions to make their beliefs sound rational. So for, enlight uh, for enlightenment, um, they cannot be uh, metaphysics, they cannot be reliable, and all of the other uh, sources of, uh, of knowledge that enlightenment deems um, irrational. Um, those cannot be reliable because we cannot deduce anything from them. They are just particular beliefs and not universal ones, and therefore they are unreliable. So enlightenment argues that we should do the opposite. We should deduce the particular from the universal, and the universal is logic. It is a unified system of knowledge. 
as they say, reason is a faculty of deducing the particular from the universal. According to Kant, the homogeneity of the general and the particular is guaranteed by the schematism of pure understanding, by which he means the unconscious activity of the intellectual mechanism which structures perception in accordance with the understanding. So the point of reason is to put some order or classification among perception. I perceive something or I have an opinion, I have to know which scientific or logical category that perception or, or opinion belongs to. Uh, it's like when people tell you, think before you speak. Uh, what they mean is, um, is that you have like an opinion or belief in mind, but before you speak it out, before that opinion enters into your you know, subjectivity, let's say, uh, by which you mean we, when you act out on it, let's say, uh, you must first make sure that it corresponds to the right category or, uh, you know, it has, it, ha it has to be objective if you want. Your speech uh, is valid once your opinion, experience, perception, etc. correspond to the logic, uh, to, uh, to the rules of logic. What this means is that the correspondence between nature and the system of knowledge must be maintained. When, uh, when I see a tree, I must uh, instantly classify it among its logical categories. Um, and so as they say, quoting Kant's critique of, uh, of judgment this time, this harmony of nature with our cognitive faculty is presupposed a priori by the, uh, by, by the judgment. It is the guiding thread of organized experience. So what this amounts to is the, let's say, worship of facts. The unity between logic and experience must produce facts. A fact is something that, uh, that we know uh, and we can be sure of its certainty, or at least we can be sure that it is a reliable piece of information. And the reason why we need facts is because knowledge isn't disinterested. Uh, it has an impact on the world. It's about praxis. Um, we want to be sure of our knowledge so that we can participate, uh, we can practice, let's say, we can practice that knowledge on the world. We can transform it for our best interests. Um, if there are sciences where being wrong doesn't matter because it has no impact on praxis, at best we won't care much about it. But in other cases, if there is no unity between the theory and the real world, like when scientists make uh, experiments in a lab, uh, if there is no correspondence between what they are producing in the lab and the real world, then there, there's going to be a problem. Uh, laboratory experience ha uh, has an impact. Um, they are designed to be, uh, to be later on applied in the real world, so the theory must not conflict with praxis. Theories predict an event, and if in the experience the event doesn't occur, or in worst case scenario the unexpected happens, like when a bridge collapses, or when you know the crop fails, or when the medicine causes, uh, causes illness, um, then we are in deep trouble. In such cases, quote, a lack of systemic thinking, a violation of logic, is not a fleeting perception, but sudden death. So the lack of unity in question means death for enlightenment. So again, Think about the principle of self-preservation, the minority that Kant talked about, which can also be uh, translated by uh, immaturity, let's say. Um, it is the inability for human beings to preserve themselves because what they believe is in conflict with praxis or their praxis is in conflict with logic. And so what happens is the kind of mentality that says that uh, whatever allows me to survive must be right. And so in that thinking, the slave owner has reasons to hold on to his slaves because it is what allows him to survive. Uh, the capitalist has to exploit his workers because that's what allows him to survive. Uh, the patriarchal man has to uh, dominate his wife and, uh, and, and his concubines because that's what allows him to survive. So the bottom line is that enlightenment thinks that reason will solve everything, like the, the parties, capitalist and, and worker, um, they must simply sit down and discuss until reason sorts out what is the best thing to do. But here reason conceals the fact that these parties have conflicting interests that cannot be reconciled. Uh, it, argues, um, it argues that uh, what matters is the whole, it is the system that makes society works. If slavery maintains society, it is what preserves society, then slavery must be maintained. And so the conflicting interest of the slave and the owner, if irreconcilable, should work together somehow for the benefits of the whole. And so as long as we follow the universals, then our organization will be, will be fine, even if that organization implies that some will be the servants of others. 
So if reason tells us uh, that some must rule while the, while the many must be ruled, then there is nothing we can do about it, you know, because it is justified by reason. And by reason we mean following the internal logic that we are born with, the, sche the, the, the schemas uh, which we discussed uh, in uh, the concept of enlightenment. So, to remind briefly, the word is actually already contained within our mind. We are born with the same patterns that rule over nature. All we have to do is just follow the patterns in our mind and we should be fine. Um, so that's schematism as they define it, the true nature of the schematism which externally coordinates the universal and the particular, the concept of the individual, uh, the concept and the individual uh, case finally turns out uh, in uh, current science to be the interest of industrial society. So what Kant was doing was saying that the mind works like a factory and therefore everything must be viewed through the schema of a factory of calculating and planning. So nature can only be apprehended through the interests of industrial society. Our relationship with nature and other beings must be like the factory manager with his workers and the material he transforms with his machines, uh, meaning manipulation and administration. As they continue, being is apprehended in terms of manipulation and administration. Everything, including the, uh, the individual human being, not to mention the animal, becomes a repeatable, replaceable process, a mere example of the conceptual models of the system. So in this way, the apparatus controls perception before perception even, control, uh, even, uh, even occurs. Sorry. Uh, the system has already decided how we should look at nature and other beings before we even see them. Uh, like it arranges our mind in ways that it will perceive what the apparatus wanted to perceive. Um, and this sort of society wants to, um, it wants you to see trees as stables and furniture, uh, animals as fur, uh, human beings as machines. So it will tell you that, um, um, it will tell you that you, um, it will tell you that it is rational to see them in that way. And that, can, uh, and that is the condition for perception. That condition is already pres uh, present in our mind. Quote, the citizens see the word as made I, uh, I priori of the stuff from which he himself constructs it. Kant intuitively anticipates what Hollywood has consciously put into practice. Images are uh, pre-censored during production by the same standard of understanding which will later determine their, rece their reception by viewers. So in this way, enlightenment basically traps individual into boxes. It determines in advance what you, uh, what you are, even before you are born. Um, and since it applies to everyone, since it standardized this a priori production of judgment, uh, then its uh, authority is seen as democratic because you know it treats everyone in this uh, in this uh, in this way everyone is assigned to a certain group democratically meaning that everyone becomes a nobody in the same way and thus um, uh, this sorry uh, this like uh, uh, this like the joke when you say i am not a racist i hate everyone equally uh, like i can be i cannot i cannot be a dictator because uh, i have classified everyone to a social group equally right and so as such anyone who tries to break free from the box that, that they are uh, that they are in uh, from their category from their national or social group is acting against reason and therefore against self preservation uh, individuality is seen as a suicide attempt because individuality puts the system in danger so the individual because the individual, I mean, the individual cannot be computed by the system since the system works through large numbers. Uh, the, standardiza the standardization process requires that everyone, um, uh, that everyone don't just get, you know, uh, treated equally in the meaning of being treated in the same way, but also that they are all the same, even ontologically. Uh, the more identical people are, the easier it is to manage them. And as such, individuals in themselves don't matter, just like the individual lab, uh, the individual lab rat uh, doesn't matter either. You know, a lab rat is replaceable. That's why we can do whatever we want to it. Adorno and Hockheimer compare science to insurance companies who don't care about the specific people who die. They say, who dies is unimportant. What matters is the ratio of uh, inside um, incidences of death to the liabilities of the company. It is the law of large numbers, not the particular case which recurs in the formula. So the idea, the idea that uh, general and particular are 
confounded uh, or confused doesn't really guarantee the respect and rights of specific individuals. If the particular becomes the same as the general, then the particular becomes inexhaustive. Uh, there will always be human beings, so why should we care about losing a few? Uh, and even if we try to find uh, reassurance in the idea that the particular is brought to the level of the general, like, you know, some sort of, you know, apo uh, apotheosis, um, what it means is that, that I'm, uh, what it means is that I am not unique, but that I am identical to everyone else. To become, you know, gods for human beings means to be under, undifer undifferentiated from the matter that we exploit, transform, eat, and defecate. You know, that's what it means to for the particular to become the general. So the fact that we have no identity or individuality means that we have no awareness of ourselves. Consciousness becomes a machine, a tool, a process. Uh, the world that enlightenment produced is a world without consciousness, a world of, uh, a world of unawareness. Just a big machine working without knowing what it is. And this is what science is, after all. It's a method of inquiry, a tool to extract information, like a machine is a tool to, to extract something from the ground. Hence, science, or the system of knowledge, is not truth, uh, but it is a tool to arrive at truth, uh, a tool among others. But here's where enlightenment makes an extra step. Since it is radically unifying, it goes as far as positing that the tool is the truth. Science itself has no awareness of itself, it is merely a tool. Enlightenment, however, is the philosophy which equates truth with the scientific system. So truth itself becomes the machine. Uh, truth becomes the machine itself, the medium, the tool to truth is truth. So truth requires Consciousness or awareness, but since consciousness too was degraded to superstition and thrown out, then the only thing that is left to be, uh, you know, to be any standard of truth, well, it is the tool. And so Kant said that truth and scientific system uh, systems are identical, and he tried to justify it philosophically, meaning that he tried to make science conscious or self-aware. He tried to give science some sort of, you know, transcendence beyond itself as just a tool. Um, but what he ended up with uh, were metaphysical notions that don't really have anything to do with science. And so Enlightenment, as the authors argue, have rejected Kant's transcendental, uh, uh, transcendental work uh, regarding science because it was seen as dogmatic. It's, uh, it's again theological mumbo-jumbo rationalized and disguised as reason. So to say that science is aware of itself is like attributing to the tool a soul and that is uh, animism. As Donald Hockheimer said, the notion of the self-understanding of science conflicts with the concept of science itself. Science is a technical operation as far removed from reflection, uh, from reflection on its own, uh, on its own objectives, uh, 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 on its own objectives, uh, as is any other form of, la of labor under the uh, pressure of the system. So because self-understanding is in part of science, this leads science to be indifferent to also questions of morality. Being self-reflective also means questioning ourselves on ethical grounds. I am aware of myself when I ask if, I am, uh, if, what, I am, uh, if what I am doing is morally good or bad. So morality has to be involved here. But then morality is also knowledge. It's, uh, it's about knowing what is right and what is wrong. And as such, it should too be su subjected to the criteria of science. Like what tools do we have at our disposal to know if an action is right and wrong? So Kant is often remembered uh, for his moral philosophy. Uh, without getting into, uh, into its details, Kant wanted to ground morality in reason. Morality was the... Um, Morality was um, was under uh, the authority of the church back then. It was, you know, religion that decided on uh, on matters of right and wrong. But religion can no longer be a reliable guide for knowledge, including moral uh, moral knowledge. And as such, science must step in and take uh, and take morality. And so, for Kant, people can be moral without having to rely on an authority to tell them what is right and what is wrong. Uh, their reason guide them to moral answers. However, it turns out that morality well, is like consciousness. The reason why consciousness and morality were reliant on religion and on spirituality wasn't because the church had its, had its hands on them um, and we were waiting for philosophers to liberate those uh, subjects from religious uh, superstitions, but because those subjects, uh, morality, uh, don't have much to do with reason. Uh, so morality itself became, be became to be seen as superstition and metaphysics. 
uh, it too became, uh, became a sort of disguise for theology and religion, and like them, it needed to be replaced by reason or intellectual notions to justify itself and the material interest of dominant, uh, of dominant groups. And so soon enough, as they write, philosophers ally themselves in practice with the powers that they condemn in theory. The theories are logical and hard, while the moral philosophies are uh, propagand propagandistic and sentimental, even when rigorous in tone, or else the moral philosophies are acts of violence performed in the awareness uh, that morality is non-deducible, like Kant's uh, recourse to treating moral forces as facts. So in other words, morality is just about practice. You cannot say that morality is just a theory, for example. No, you need to act morally. But then you have a dichotomy between uh, practice and theory. The things that can justify morality are not rational but sentimental. We are more motivated, morally speaking, by values rather than by facts. But values don't exist in the real physical world, and so they are just fairy tales. Now, this is the, uh, um, the philosophy of nominalism uh, that we also discussed in the, uh, in, uh, in the concept of enlightenment. So theory simply disproves morality, which means that since reason, uh, theory, says that morality doesn't exist, because, you know, it doesn't exist in the physical world, then if someone acts ethically, they will be no different from tyrants. So the only way out is to treat moral forces like facts. But that means that there has to be a universal principle from which moral facts would derive. But according to enlightenment, moral facts are non-deducible, meaning that you cannot derive them from universal facts. So there are no, uh, moral facts are no different from belief in unicorns and witchcraft. And so Kant himself could find no support for moral claims and therefore, as the authors write, the citizen who renounced a, a profit out of the Kantian motive for um, Kantian, Kantian motive of respect for the mere form uh, of, of the law would not be enlightened but superstitious, a fool. So Kant was a deontologist, meaning someone who believes um, that there are things that are always immoral to do and things that must um, uh, must always be done because they are good in themselves. So those are called uh, categorical imperatives. Uh, two examples that the authors uh, mentioned, given by, uh, by Kant, are love and respect. For Kant, if these two collapse, then the world will, uh, will be immoral. Uh, so they quote from, uh, quote from the dialectics. Um, if, Kant, uh, if Kant writes in response to uh, Heller, one of these uh, great moral forces, reci reciprocal love and respect were to collapse, then nothingness, immorality, with gaping maw would uh, drink the whole realm of moral beings like a drop of water. So, for Kant, it is a moral duty to always love and respect others, no matter what the circumstances. It is from, uh, this is from Kant's Metaphysics uh, of Morals, the part of the Doctrine of, uh, of Virtue, uh, paragraph 20, 24. Um, Haller was a Swiss uh, physiologist. Uh, so we don't we don't really care about that. So it's someone someone that uh, that uh, Kant uh, criticized. Uh, the point is that for Kant, moral actions are necessary, and therefore mutual love and respect must always be the priority. And as such, acting morally will often conflict with our self-interest, which will conflict with self-preservation. So uh, I mean, what conflicts with self-interest means that it conflicts with self-preservation. So if you refuse to do something, uh, to do something bad out of moral deontological, uh, out of moral deontology, uh, out of a principle of uh, you know a Kantian principle, that would be irrational from the standpoint of enlightenment. You will be following a superstition, and thus you will be a fool. If any, if anyone follows your example, we will fall back into barbarism. So what enlightenment is arguing is that if we all behave morally, we'll cause our own doom. For enlightenment, you, um, for enlightenment, you should always go for the action that is more likely to guarantee your self-preservation, even if that means violating moral principles. So from the standpoint of reason and science, moral actions have nothing special. Um, the behavior itself is physical, like the behavior of... Uh, uh, just like the behavior of, immor of immorality. Like to study morality becomes itself like studying physical entities. Morality is just something that people do. It's just a behavior, a physical behavior and nothing more. Like when we study religious belief through anthropology, for example, it's just an archaic practice. Morality becomes archaic. 
So they quote uh, Spinoza who expressed this idea in his ethics. Enlightenment expels difference from theory. It considers human actions and desires exactly as if, uh, as if I were dealing with lines, planes and bodies. The totalitarian order has put this into effect in utter seriousness. So this brings us to the fascists who viewed uh, morality as a sign of uh, decay of the bourgeoisie. Like the moral uh, inquiries of Kant were actually a bourgeois attitude, trying to establish a universal form of moral conduct that wouldn't be instrumental, was an attitude of people who indeed don't live with the fear of going, of going hungry the next day. So the, bourgeois, uh, the bourgeoisie kept paradoxically a certain asceticism, um, asceticism, sorry, uh, they had like two worlds, a world of instrumental reason, which maintained the economic system that enslaves workers to provide, uh, to provide for, uh, uh, for, uh, for the bourgeoisie, and then there is another world in which they can devote their time to moral acts. Uh, so both words were uh, ir uh, irreconcilable, like we, like we saw in Kant's conflict between reason and morality, but at least moral concerns were present. Uh, the businessmen of the 18th and the 19th century paradoxically maintained a certain moral ideal opposed to instrumental reason. But eventually this moral, uh, this moral idea crumbled when the individuals themselves of the bourgeois order were liberated from their social class. Uh, taking the inspiration from uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, the fascists looked at, looked at, uh, at, uh, at the bourgeois Kantian morality as slave morality. Uh, being moral for Nietzsche was a sign of weakness. Strong and wealthy uh, and healthy, sorry, strong and healthy individuals don't care about morality. They just do what they want and they uh, and they take what they and they take what they please. And so the fascists took on this idea. They viewed the bourgeois individual as a decaying form of nihilism and a waste of time and energy. And so entertaining uh, entertaining notions like respect and love is like believing in angels and demons. And it just, you know, prevents the strong to do what they, well, what they want. So fascism, as they write, by its iron disciple, uh, relieves its people of the burden of moral feelings. No longer needs to observe any discipline. So the result is that now the entire world must suffer, and not just uh, the workers and the poor. Even the bourgeoisie is subjected is subjected to the same violence of instrumental reason. And so the freedom from tutelage meant that from now on, everyone must kneel before calculating thought. The democratic element of enlightenment isn't freedom for all, but no privilege or morality can shield you from uh, necessary violence and brutal efficiency. And so this is where the Marquis de Sade comes in. According to the authors, he's the one who put in practice, in all of its details, the theor this theoretical evolution from Kant to Nietzsche. So, who was the, the, Marquis, uh, the Marquis de Sade? Um, well, the Marquis de Sade was a, uh, was a French, uh, French novelist and philosopher. He lived from 1740 uh, to 1814, so uh, 75, 74 years, and he was imprisoned during the French Revolution and barely escaped the guillotine. But then in 1801 he was imprisoned again and he died in prison. Um, Sade was the origin of the, um, uh, the the origin for the adge for the uh, adjective sa uh, sadist someone who enjoys hurting others or enjoys the pain of others and that's because well he was a sadist a very hardcore sadist who openly you know rejects morality for him if uh, someone gets um, pleasure out of his out of his actions uh, whether they hurt or not the person cannot be condemned morally as a matter of fact for sad there is no such thing as morality um, we will explain his philosophy through dialectic of enlightenment. Uh, Sad is the philosopher of the principle of self-preservation. Um, it is in him that the principle finds its uh, its full manifestation. Uh, like self-preservation uh, for Sad is expressed in the ability to enjoy the pain of others, because being able to inflict pain on someone else confers. I mean, it means it means that you have power. So if I hurt you then I know that I have power over you and therefore I am safe from you. You cannot be a threat to me if I am the one doing the hurt. So here, self-awareness means, uh, means being capable of hurting others while they cannot hurt me. And so uh, this, uh, this is how the, uh, the ego 
forms for sad. The ego uh, can be itself, uh, can, can, can only be itself when it is free from morality. Morality limits my range of actions, since an action that hurts others is prohibited, but for sad, uh, I won't know if I exist only when I, uh, when, when I can affirm myself on others by having power over them, otherwise I'd be in a vulnerable position as well. And so hence the ego needs to know that it is in control and that it can have autonomy, but that knowledge only comes when moral rules are transgressed. But that also means that I have to know what is the best way for me to ensure my survival. Like transgressing, transgressing moral, uh, moral uh, rules uh, isn't enough. If I try to hurt someone who is stronger than me, he can, you know, retaliate and I'll be the one dead. So I need something else than just brute force. Power then isn't limited to strength, but also to reason as well. I can use reason to make sure that I am the one at the top. Uh, it, is, um, it, is more with, uh, it is more like with science and reason, rather than just brute strength that I, can, um, that I can hurt others safely. In other words, it is by planning that I can, uh, it's by planning that I can uh, make sure that others won't, uh, won't hurt me. So the powerful wants to have a mechanical system that guarantees the outcome that they benefit from the suffering of others. So the ego becomes that system. As Adorno and Hockheimer write, it, pa uh, it passes from the expropriated citizens to the totalitarian trust masters whose science has uh, become the quintessence, uh, quint quintessence of the methods by which the subjugated mass, so mass society reproduces itself. So the subjugated mass society is, um, is the masses who suffer while the rulers, uh, the masters, pick up the fruits of the masses' suffering. They just enjoy the suffering of the masses. And so this is the dream of enlightenment since Machiavelli and Hobbes. The prince in Machiavelli or the state, the Leviathan in uh, Thomas Hobbes, are entities, after the most, um, are entities that are after uh, the most efficient way to maintain social structure in which the rulers enjoy the pain of the ruled and make, sh uh, and make that structure reproduce itself mechanically. Like you don't even need to push buttons or everything, the damn thing works on its own. And thus, being completely mechanical, like a machine, it works without any value. It doesn't care about the purpose it is being used for. It makes no difference whether uh, reason is being used for peace or war or tolerance or oppression. Reason simply serves the interests of the state of the powerful. So, if the interests of the powerful is to enforce wars, then reason serves that interest. If the interest is peace, then reason can serve peace. So reason depends on what is giving, uh, um, on what on what given interests uh, there are, uh, what interests uh, happen to be those of the powerful uh, of the powerful or of the social structure. So thus, reason isn't something that thinks outside of the system, but it is an organ of the system or its servant. Uh, reason becomes the instrument that executes the will of nature, uh, like the will of God or the will of the rulers. So it, uh, it therefore becomes unable to question what it is doing. It simply reduces, uh, it is simply reduced to, uh, to executing tasks and that's it. Uh, so those three things, uh, nature, God and rulers, are actually the same. In the state of nature, morality has no value since nature subjugates all creatures and therefore it is safe from moral judgment or criticism. You have, uh, you have reason in nature to survive within nature and reproduce nature, not to criticize nature. Uh, it is only when nature can no longer enforce its violence on you that you can be hostile towards its violence and you can, you know, criticize it morally. Uh, likewise, God doesn't allow you to morally criticize him. Uh, he gave you reason to serve his will. And even if you don't apply reason like he told you to, uh, like he told you to, in the end, he will be the moral judge. You, on the other hand, will not. And likewise, it was only when the church could no longer, uh, could no longer fully enforce its authority that reason became hostile to it. And the same reason, uh, and the same reason that uh, that was hostile to nature, replaced uh, replaced it with God, which means that later on the rulers, the prince and uh, and the leviathan, replaced God too because his authority is no longer enforced. As they say, that spirit is hostile to authority only when authority lacks the strength to enforce obedience and to uh, violence only when violence is not an established fact. 
So what the ruler want, uh, wants is to establish uh, their own violence as a fact, which means that obedience to the ruler must be just obvious. So you have, so you have to obey because that is your nature. You have to be ruled. You have to reproduce that nature. Uh, you have to reproduce God's will. You have to reproduce the planning of the powerful. You must reproduce the interest of those who yield reason. Our bodies are like, you know, the ground for the expression of the will of the powerful. And so this is why the authors insist on this. We never left the state of nature. Becoming simply an organ, thinking reverts to nature. For the rulers, however, human beings become mere material, as the whole of nature has become material for society. So reason becomes about enforcing terror. And as we moved from nature, from God to rulers, that terror only grew. And as the world gets more and more rationalized, uh, terror and violence increase uh, uh, increase and so it resembles more and more the terror and savagery uh, savagery in the state of nature so at least with God the church had an element of morality within its laws and uh, within its rules which kept you know the violence sort of uh, sort of in check um, even after the crumbling of the church the interlude of liberalism with its emphasis on reason and deliberation to set the matters did keep the power of bourgeois individuals in check but as the bourgeoisie crumbles due to its increasing monopoly and capitalism, violence is suddenly unleashed. And so fascism is this archaic terror in rationalized form. So the powerful feel, uh, feels justified in applying all kinds of violence to preserve themselves without any shame, without any restraint, without any guilt. And so this is what Sad promotes in his novels. In Juliette, uh, Juliette, one of his most famous uh, novels uh, and the case study of this excursus, one of the main characters says this. The religious chimera, says the prince of uh, Francavilla at the, at the court uh, of King uh, Ferdinand of Naples, um, must, um, must be replaced by utmost terror. The people must be freed, so the religious uh, chimeras must be replaced by utmost terror. The people must be freed from the fear of a future hell. Once that is destroyed, they will abandon themselves to anything. But that chimer uh, chimerical fear must be replaced by penal laws of enormous severity, which, uh, which apply, of course, only to the people, since they alone cause unrest in the state. Uh, male contents are born only to the lower classes. What do the rich care for the idea of a leash they will never feel themselves, if this empty semblance gives them the, the right to grind down those living under the, their yoke? You will find no one in that class who will not permit the darkest shadow of tyranny to fall on him, provided it really falls on others. So, the liberation from religious terror is only to lead to a greater terror. So the rejection of religion also comes with re the rejection of morality. So these two things, religion and morality, are dismissed as regressive chimeras of the past. So progress means that the powerful gets to do whatever the hell they want without being bothered by morality. There is no morality, no aesthetic judgments either. Power is neutral as, uh, as in it, uh, it doesn't discriminate. You cannot be subjective if you let the lion eat the gazelle, right? So the use of reason means legitimizing the power of some, uh, of some over others. Since their power is rational and reason is neutral, well, reason cannot make moral judgments like it cannot make aesthetic judgments either. Then no one can blame the powerful for opposing, uh, for oppressing, sorry, the ruled. So the powerful must do everything that they want because otherwise they will regress, uh, they will repress, sorry, they will regress and they will repress their potential. And if there is something that enlightenment hates, is wasted potential. So to impose morality on the lion is to let his strength go to waste. And so in this regard, enlightenment is pretty much like sports. In sports, they say, no member is, uh, is in doubt over his, uh, his role and a replacement is held uh, ready for each. So every athlete must do the best, uh, the best, all, uh, the best all of their ca capabilities. 
and if they cannot, they can be replaced by anyone right away. When they reach their limits, you know, when they are, when they are too, uh, too tired, when we can just replace them right there on the spot. So planning and knowledge have therefore a coordinated expression in sports. We plan the game, we prepare for all possible uh, strategies and scenarios, even combination must be thought of, every uh, cell in the body must be optimized. Like in sports, you have the expression of uh, the expression of carpe diem, seize the day, to seize every opportunity in order to optimize yourself. And so in the fascist ideology, every moment of life must not go to, way, uh, to, way, uh, to waste, but must be enjoyed. Enjoyed in the sense of, you know, feeling that we are self-preserving ourselves. So enjoyment is intertwined with power. You must enjoy means you must exploit everything all the time. Do not let anything go to waste. And what is the best image for enjoyment than sexuality? Sex is viewed in the same way as sports. We must enjoy everything that it has to offer, all the positions, combinations, holes, everything. No moment is unused, no body orifice neglected, no function left inactive. So what this means is that it is not really the pleasure that we are looking for, but the organization that provides the pleasure. We are more hyped by the fact that we can get pleasure efficiently than by the, pre the pleasure itself. And so this is why fascist structures, which claim to, uh, to aim at pleasure, are extremely oppressive. What people are getting aroused by is the planification, the organization, the machine that extracts pleasure. It is the fact that we can exploit in the most rational and efficient way that gives the boner. What seems to matter in such events, more than pleasure itself, is the busy, uh, the busy pursuit of pleasure, its organization. Just as in other the, uh, mytholo mythologized epochs, Imperial Rome, the Renaissance and the Baroque, the schema of activity counted for more than its content. So in other words, we want the form and not really the content. And it is how we get, you know, uh, it is how we get it, it is how how we get sex that matters not the sex itself the means becomes the end of this world the tool becomes the truth what counts is no longer you got pleasure sure this can have its importance having sex through consensual means is important but it is weird for someone to be aroused by the consent itself and not by the sex right it's like you didn't really want sex but you just want it to be perceived as someone who values consent like once your partner agreed uh, you are no longer excited you just want consent for consent but well but that is what's happening here you have just planning for the sake of planning what matters is the procedure considered to be the most efficient uh, the most efficient one because it is totalizing and so this leads to a paradox in which the most libertine society have the most oppressive structures. So Saad was a, was a libertine, and uh, the authors uh, mention his, uh, his other famous novel, um, 120 Jours de Sodom, 120 Days of Sodom, in which uh, you have a strict and rigid uh, hierarchy and organization to make orgies. And it is actually based on the social structures of, of free, uh, free mas uh, masonry. So, well, the social regime in, uh, in uh, 100 day, uh, 120 days of Sodom uh, is doing is that it brought the idea of harmony and perfection to the world. The planning of reason, as we said many times, is about building the perfect, harmonious world that religion have hypothes uh, hypothesized uh, in, uh, in the great beyond. It's like, you know, with reason we will establish the kingdom of God on earth. But the kingdom of God is just, you know, planning made universal. That's not even, you know, pleasure. Uh, there's no even pleasure, no imagination, no morali morality, nothing, but, but just a big computer devoid of qualities. Kind of like in dystopian novels or science fiction where you have a, a giant artificial intelligence that is devoid of feelings, that applies strict rationality and controls everything, and it's, you know, usually not a jolly place. Um, Sad already thought of that. Um, the novel uh, Juliet is basically a manual for Big Brother. And so this is, uh, this is the prince again speaking. 
Um, just so, replied the prince in sad to uh, the speaker just quoted, the government itself must control the population. It must possess the means to exterminate the people should it fear, should it fear them or to increase their numbers should it consider that nece necessary. Um, and nothing should weigh in the balance of its justice except its own interests or passions, together only with the passions and interests of those who, as we have said, have been granted just enough power to multiply our own. Take away its god from the people you wish to subjugate and you will demoralize it. As long as it has no other god than yours, you will always be its master. Grant it in return the widest, most criminal license and never punish it except when it turns against you. So it cannot be more explicit than this. Only use violence on people when the people are a threat to you, uh, are a threat to your life. When they turn against you, you destroy them. But as long as they are not a threat to your pleasure, they can do whatever they want, even the most he uh, heinous crime. And so, given that the only, uh, the only goal is to uh, the only goal to reason is to maintain a system, it doesn't care about anything substantial. It just tries to maintain a form without caring about its content. Uh, reason has no substantial goal. Um, a substantial goal is a goal that is, you know, that is good in the sense of value. A substantial goal can be a moral goal or a beautiful goal or a subjective goal. Uh, the fulfillment of the members of society is a substantial goal, for example. It is a goal that has reason to exist, uh, whereas the goal of maintaining a form for its own sake, uh, for its own sake, seems hollow. Uh, it's like, it's like as we said, consent for the sake of. Uh, uh, I mean, you have consent for the sake of healthy sex, and then you have consent for its own sake. And as such, you know, since reason has no substantial goal, it has no effects either. Um, well, more precisely, it's not that it has no effects. Uh, more like it doesn't give a shit about effects. Um, affects are like, you know, emotions and feelings. Um, they're the things that make us aware that we are not an AI, for example, or machines, because having a feeling makes us aware. Whenever we are aware of something, we are feeling something at that moment. And so enlightenment reason is not that it has no effects, but that the effects themselves are reduced to mere natural things. When a thing, you know, touches me, I am aware of it because there is a feeling that comes with it. Without the feeling, I won't be aware that something is touching me because feelings are what grounds my subjectivity. But that would mean that the feeling has to be different from the matter that is touching me. Feelings, uh, feelings aren't just, you know, another material or a natural thing, but that is what reason does. It turns effects into natural things as well. So basically, uh, natural things cannot tell me that I exist. The feeling that I get from being in contact with those things tell me that I exist. But if the feelings themselves are also natural things, then I don't exist. Nothing is telling me that I, that, that I exist. And so this is what is going on here. It's not that reason doesn't have effects. It just sees them uh, as natural things too. As reason posits no substantial goals, all effects are equally remote to it. They are merely natural. So, in the society described by the prince in, in the novel, it doesn't matter what the feelings of the masses are, all that matters is that the society's structure is maintained and nothing more. And so from this, Odono and Horkheimer, they draw the true uh, opposition between enlightenment and mythology. Uh, because even though we said multiple times that they, are, that they are basically the same, there is a certain difference. Both agree that effects are only uh, are only natural forces that okay we know but the difference is that myth gives them divine or demonic powers which come from the outside the outside world is like you know the internal world for myth rocks and trees have divine spirits uh, they have divine spirits within them and it is because of this similarity uh, between the two worlds that we can communicate so for myth, the enchanted world is already totalizing. Uh, it's already totalizing. The object, the objective, and the subjective are made uh, because uh, because they are made of the same thing. Like animism is everywhere in uh, in myth. But for enlightenment, it simply argues that the divine forces and spirits are projections of the subject, and so they are irrational and don't exist. So those entities are in reality the meaning that the subject gives 
to the world around him based on his internal state. So what enlightenment did was take the context, the meaning and uh, even life and relocate it in the subject. Like in reality, there is no context, there is no meaning or even life. They are just nominalist conceptions. And given that the individual too is made of the same matter as the natural world, there is no reason to assume that, uh, that those conceptions exist in the individual. Uh, like, you know, meaning doesn't even exist as something real within the individual, but it is just a superstition and illusion. So individuals aren't uh, even really alive. They just perceive themselves as such. And so reason tells us that life doesn't exist. Meaning or context don't exist either. Effects don't exist. All there is is nothing more than chemical reactions. Effects are reduced to just that chemical reactions in the brain, there is nothing to add to them except their auto automatic procedure. And that automatic chemical procedure is itself reason, like even reason is a chemical automatic procedure. When I think I am just doing a natural thing, a process, there is nothing important about the content of my thoughts, what matters is that I just think. And so enlightenment wants people to think, not so that they provide great thoughts, but simply so that the organ between their ears functions. So we just want our neurons to fire up electric charges, not to produce substantial thoughts. And so after all, the minute someone brings a thought, that would be, you know, viewed as a threat to the system. If I have a substantial thought, that would be viewed as a threat to the system, and so it will unleash its violence. Uh, you know, like the quote uh, from... Uh, like, uh, like in the quote by the prince, we can have you know all the th all the thoughts that we want, even the most uh, heinous thoughts are allowed. The problem is when people take their thoughts for reality and try to act out on them, and so that's why you constantly hear of you know capitalist gurus and managers promoting critical thinking and teachers in, uh, encouraging you to be constantly thinking it's just to power up the big machine not to bring any substantial substantial thinking uh, you are not allowed to have any substance only the chemical reactions of an automated procedure you know like think just think like like a machine you know we want you to think but just as a machine like do not have any substance so for enlightenment this is a quote. For enlightenment, reason is the chemical agent which absorbs the real substance of, uh, of things and volatilizes it into the mere autonomy of reason. The subject, according to its own concept, had been turned into a single, unrestricted, empty authority. So basically, the authors argue that people were afraid of nature because nature enslaves people, uh, it enslaves them through affects, nature causes our feelings and emotions, and out of those we produce superstitions which make us uh, more vulnerable to nature's control. So the solution is to find a way to make affects inoffensive, and that is by arguing that everything that we take as objective reality is actually a projection of our affects. The only thing that really exists is, un, uh, is undifferentiated matter, and everything else is just a veil for the chaos of that matter. So whenever someone claims that he has something objective, he is just projecting a veil to hide the unfathomable nature of reality, which is caused by that reality. Like reality's chaotic and uh, unintelligible nature causes you to project a veil on it, a veil of context meaning and life so the objective means to uh, to be objective sorry to be objective means to claim that there is nothing objective that everything we take as real is actually the cause of an effect and as such everything that is a content is just an illusion and the only thing that is real is just the process of making that illusion and so that's why the individual is an empty authority for the subject to take control over nature, he has to empty himself and also nature of all content. The subject must be the form and reproduce the form and that's it. The whole of nature simply becomes something that resists the uh, subject's control. And so the problem is that, uh, is that, uh, the problem is that form is actually chaos since it itself has no awareness. 
the form of chaos is chaotic because it lacks self-awareness. It is not different from insanity. A crazy person has no sense of self, but is just a bunch of procedures going in all directions, like uh, like the architecture we know we mentioned in the first video on the culture industry. It goes it goes in all direction. It has no substance, and therefore reason too. Uh, I mean, reason since it too is reduced to just a form, it becomes chaotic and is like you know a crazy a crazy person. It is complete. Reason becomes irrational. So the rationality of enlightenment is just unfettered irrationality. It denies that there is an actual order to the universe. Um, quote, the particular mythology which uh, the uh, Western Enlightenment, including Calvinism, had to do away with, uh, with was the Catholic doctrine of the Ordo and the pagan popular religion which continued to flourish beneath it. To liberate human beings from such beliefs was the objective or bourgeois philosophy. So the order refers to the claim, uh, to the to the chain of beings, like God created a universe that has an objective order to it, where all beings are like you know the links of a chain. And so for enlightenment, that is just superstitious bullshit. Enlightenment thought that we can actually have order, of course. Uh, all we had to do, uh, they thought, was to focus on the forms, and eventually the order will follow uh, will follow naturally. So the liberal market that Enlightenment brought was the praxis of that theory. Just make everything into transactions and, uh, and normally everything should be happy, right? Uh, so markets precisely don't care about content. They just put infrastructure for circulation and movement and whatever emerges from, uh, from that has no intrinsic meaning or value to it. So what matters isn't, um, isn't what people produce. What matters is that they produce stuff. So the infrastructure of the market is simply concerned with the happening of trade and production, not what is being pr traded, produced, or even more importantly, why is it even traded or produced? Uh, the result of this, well, the market economy, it, uh, it unleashed, um, it uh, refers to the Enlightenment. So the market economy that the Enlightenment unleashed was at once the prevailing form of reason and the power which ruined reason. The romantic reaction, uh, reactionaries only expressed what the bourgeois themselves had realized that freedom in their world tended towards organized anarchy. So, organized anarchy is of course uh, an absurdity, which highlights the insanity of enlightenment. Reason for, uh, for enlightenment turns out to mean we rationally do the irrational, we organize chaos, we put, we put on infrastructures to perpetuate chaos and violence. And so the fascist state is rational in the sense that it is calculating the most efficient way to cause more chaos. And so this absurdity makes enlightenment no different from the ideologies that it criticizes. Uh, the Catholic counter-enlightenment movements, for example, were right into pointing to enlightenment its irrationality, like enlightenment pointed the irrationality of religion and Catholicism. Uh, like at least pre-enlightenment thinking held that, held that effects are not of the uh, are not of the same equal value. Uh, so this discrimination had an advantage, which is it allowed the effects to be experienced and attribute uh, to them their uniqueness. But when they are all equally valid, none can actually be experienced, or at least none can have value on their own. You um, you won't know what to do with those affects. It's like when you are told that all paintings are equally beautiful. You won't know which one to pick, which one to contemplate. And so in this situation, the only criterion is which one guarantees my self-preservation. Like we said many times, when everything is an illusion, the only criterion for truth is the utility of the illusion. And that's what market economies uh, took as their base principle. In market economy, the ego is the primary drive. The ego seeks its self-preservation, and through markets, the uh, thinkers of the early bourgeoisie, like Machiavelli, Hobbes, and uh, Mondeville, they thought that people can follow their, uh, their, their, their egoistic drives without leading to violence. Um, Mondeville is mentioned in the book, uh, he is famous for his fable of the bees, which argues that when, when the bees try to be virtuous, they lead to the collapse of the hive. But when each one simply follows its egoistic vices, then the hive survives. Um, 
the vices of each lead to the virtues of the whole. Uh, the thinkers of the uh, early bourgeoisie basically argue that the reason why people keep killing each, uh, each other is because they are told to act against their natural instinct. Uh, churches and religions and philosophies say that uh, people should act morally, right? That's what the classicists taught. Uh, but the bourgeois philosophers say that acting morally is impossible. It is against human nature, which is inherently selfish. Thus, by forcing me to be selfless, I'll be more violent because acting against my nature simply makes me more frustrated. So they thought, uh, they thought of a way to allow people to enjoy their egoistic pleasures and drives without leading to wars and shit. And so their solution was, um, on the one hand, you have a market which, leads, uh, which lets them trade everything, uh, everything, and so they can have whatever they desire. And on the other, you have a strong state that would use direct violence when the people start misbehaving. And so the goal is just to find the most efficient way to maintain order and minimize chaos. And so this way they thought both individual and society, both nature and self, uh, the, the particular and the universal would be reconciled finally since both would obey the same unifying principle, self-preservation. But the outcome was not order and peace, but organized chaos. The, they thought that if people follow the principle of self-preservation and market economy, everything would be fine, but the opposite happened. Quote, with the development of the economic system in which the control of the economic apparatus by private groups creates a division between human beings, self-preservation, although treated by, uh, by reason as identical, had, beca had become the reified drive of each individual citizen and proved to be a destructive natural force no longer distingu distinguishable from self-destruction. So like we said, reason turned out to be unreason. We, uh, what we got was an Orwellian nightmare, irrationality becomes rational. We were uh, you know, promised a utopia by bourgeois society, but what we got is just planned, uh, planned calamity. However, with the revolutionary avant-garde, the utopia which proclaimed the reconciliation between nature and the self emerged from its hiding place in German philosophy as something at once irrational and reasonable as the idea of, of the community of free individuals and brought down on, its, uh, on itself the full fury of reason. So the asterisk there refers to, uh, to a famous uh, formulation from Karl Marx's uh, Capital uh, volume, uh, volume 1. Um, th that's from chapter 1 where he says, imagine the community of free individuals who live in uh, communism and they share the means of production. Um, he mentioned Kruber, he mentions uh, Robinson Crusoe saying that imagine that um, imagine that it is everyone working like uh, imagine if everyone is working like Crusoe. The problem isn't that Crusoe doesn't share the, doesn't share the food that he produced, but that he doesn't share the means to produce the food. Like private property, property is problematic because it alienates others from the capacity to work and produce their own stuff. So if you produce oranges, the oranges are your property, but the land and the tools that you use to produce your oranges shouldn't be yours. And so that's what we, uh, that's what we collectivize. Not the food you produced, but the means to produce the food. But here, Odono and Horkheimer imply that the utopia of Marx, uh, if it works through the same ideals as enlightenment and reason, like in capitalism, what it brings is the fury of reason on itself. Reason is supposed to bring the community of free individual, but the result is that reason brings the community of violence and slaves. So it is also a warning for Marxism, who also who claims that they are working for the establishment of Marxist community of free individuals while using the tools of enlightenment. After all, the same utopia is, view, is viewed as myth from the point of view of uh, enlightenment. So why shouldn't we abolish, uh, also abolish it as mere superstition, just like the rest? If Marx uh, viewed a society where reason would lead to a moral lifestyle, then Marx society is a chimera like the city of God of Augustine and the Republic of Plato. So the community of free individual requires more than calculation, but also, but also truth through alternative modes of thinking, subjectivity, art, imagination, spirituality, all have their legitimacy in the quest for knowledge. And so these are modes that are not rational from the point of view of enlightenment, and so they are excluded from knowledge. And so this is what Adorno and Horkheimer call irrationalism. 
It is when rationality excludes everything it suspects as irrational and therefore keeps a kind of knowledge that destroys itself, but keeps it because it's the only one that reason finds rational. It is like, you know, a fanatic dogmatism in rationality. Uh, holding on to, rational to rationality when rationality is destroying humanity and the world, that is irrationalism. Um, at least they argue the philosophies of, uh, of the rationalists like Leibniz, Kant and Hegel, although they have, they have made a distinction between subjective knowledge, like you know, feelings, art, religion, and objective knowledge, uh, meaning science, they allow a certain dialectical interaction between the two. But as they say, irrationalism, which they equate to uh, modern positivism, draws a strict line between feeling in the form of religion and art and anything deserving the name of knowledge. Although irrationalism restricts cold reason in uh, favor of immediate life, it turns the latter into a principle merely hostile to thought. And so this is what we, uh, what we said earlier about affects. It is not that reason doesn't have affects or feelings, uh, it's that it excludes them by reducing them to simple natural beings. Uh, being uh, simple chemical uh, reactions, their power is neutralized because now reason can manipulate them like it manipulates matter. Uh, and so that's why, despite, this, despite the separation between the forms of knowledge, uh, we live in a society that seems like it's all about affects. In movies, songs, TV shows and talk shows, in advertisement, etc., it seems like we are living in deeply emotional societies. However, the authors note this paradox. They argue that the more emotions are on display, are on screens, the more repressed they are. People are allowed to see emotions but never to experience them. It's like, you know, in some civilization, civilization where you see uh, the art that is being produced is highly erotic, and yet the societies are, uh, uh, are you know, uh, uh, the societies that are, you know, that are, you know, engaged uh, in, those, uh, in those artworks, uh, those the societies that produce those artworks, they are deeply sexually repressive. And so it's the same thing here. Yes, there is a lot of, you know, pornography, a lot of erotic scenes in movies, uh, in songs. Uh, it's, it's all about, you know, it's all about sex all the time. But it doesn't mean that we have emancipated sexuality. It doesn't mean that we celebra celebrate emotions and feelings. Quite the opposite. It's like the Odyssey. Uh, it's like in the Odyssey when Odysseus, you know, meets the sirens. It's, it's like that all over again. So it is true that we... Um, uh, elevated feelings to an ideology, but that doesn't mean that we liberated feelings. It's just to make feelings more manageable that we display them all the time. We administer feelings, we decide on where or when they should be uh, perceived, uh, perceived. Uh, but again, perceived doesn't mean, doesn't mean felt. So we make a rational system that manages the irrational, you know, that, that's it, you know, we are just managing, we are rationally managing feelings, and that's it. So they say this elevation of feelings to an ideology doesn't abolish the contempt in which they are really uh, held. The fact that compared to the stereo, to the, to the starry heights into which ideology transposes them, they appear all the more vulgar merely contributes to their ostracism. So, if feelings and emotions have to be given any esteem at all, it is when they serve self-preservation. Rationality, you know, becomes a cult here. Like in cults, uh, feelings are channeled to only strengthen the power of the cult. Uh, cults are rational in the, way that, in the way that they treat emotions. They want people to be only affected in certain way and towards specific things only. In cults, the display of emotions is just a means of social control like it is in movies. And like in cults, um, thoughts, uh, thought is hindered as well. Like when you have religious leaders who trap you in a cult and prohibit thinking, you know, rationality is doing the same. Rationality hinders thought by casting everything that it cannot process, like when, you know, religious leaders cast away science because they cannot understand it. So the only thing that rationality can understand is number and equations. It posits that someone cannot misunderstand another if they speak in math. Mathematics is the universal language, so no one can misunderstand anyone else if we talk uh, if we talk uh, if we talk with math. So, giving that misunderstanding are the source of you know bloody conflicts. Enlightenment argues that whatever cannot be understood by everyone is you know regress and it is barbarism. Uh, 
And so the cult of rationality thus turns into a cult of market economy. The mathematical language of human behavior is economics. And therefore, it is left to the economy to deliberate on human affairs. If the economy leads to imperialism and world wars, then we must accept its verdict and continue, you know, the slaughter. Um, you know, just like fanatics who will do all the atrocities in the world if it was ordered by the gods, irrationalists would do all the atrocities if it is ordered by reason and the economy. If the economy leads to world, war, uh, to world wars and genocides, then, you know, we, we will... We will do. We will do those, uh, and with a and with a happy face. And so, uh, what is left is just conformism. The powerful simply conform to the system, since it allows them to have their power, and the powerless must simply adapt uh, to it in order to survive. For those at the top, sh uh, shrewd self-preservation means the fascist struggle for power, and for individuals, it means adaptation to injustice at any price. So this marks the distinction between enlightenment and everything that came before it. Enlightenment is radical. Like we said, the myths and the superstitious states uh, did, did hold some, so, some sort of objectivity, whereas enlightenment denies all forms of, ob uh, of objectivity. Objectivity itself becomes superstition. So it is true that all stages before enlightenment were acting like enlightenment in relation to what came before it, like old practices that were that were seen as adequate or normal became, became um, abominable and barbaric. So the old is cast away to make room for the new, the advanced, the rational. So there is a line that connects uh, the different stages of history, the line of destruction and, uh, and civilization. Uh, the old must be destroyed so that civilization forms. So what is civilized for those who came before us is savagery for us today. So as they say, each step has, has been an advance, a stage of enlightenment. Each new, so each, um, <coughs> sorry. Um, each new uh, form of social organization or belief of, uh, you know, of belief, of practice, is seen as an advance of the old form. To move from animism to magic is an advance, magic is enlightenment for animism, and likewise patriarchy is enlightenment to, matri to matriarchy, Catholicism is enlightenment to polytheism, the god of, uh, the god of hosts, uh, of hosts to, the, to the great mother uh, is to uh, the lamb of the... Uh, Sorry, the god of hosts is enlightenment to the great mother. The lamb is the host to the totem. It's a, uh, is enlightenment to the totem, etc. But enlightenment is radical in the sense that all the other social organizations and entities mentioned uh, did at least held to objectivity. But enlightenment doesn't even bother with affirming something objective. Any devotion which uh, believed itself objective, grounded in the matter at hand, was dispelled as mythological. So the difference is that at least with, uh, with myth, the entities replaced, uh, replaced were seen as downgraded versions of the truth. The Lamb of, of God was, you know, the better version of the totem, and therefore you, you still can find a relationship with the past that was, you know, transcended by progress. Uh, myth everywhere and at all times exhibited similar patterns and behaviors whereas we worship you know the lamb or the totem uh, whether you know sorry whether we worship the lamb or the totem there is some affinities between the two stages but with actual enlightenment we have something unprecedented something new the active attempt to break ties with the past altogether so enlightenment is the inability to form any ties or bond with the past uh, the past is always judged to be superstitious, and so it must be uh, any taboo, uh, any sorry, any lies, uh, any any ties, sorry, any ties with it uh, is seen as taboo. So to hold on to something from the past is perceived for a uh, for enlightenment as something you know that is um, uh, uh, as perverse. And as such, it applies the same, uh, the same to the ties that are necessary for the social structure of its time, the bourgeoisie. What is old isn't uh, the gods and the spells, no, it's the concept of truth itself, uh, itself now. Uh, it is objectivity that is, uh, that, that is the target of enlightenment. Uh, believing in truth for enlightenment is a boomer attitude. Uh, it, is, uh, it is so has been, and so the bourgeoisie itself cannot have ties to truth either. It must, um, it must do to, uh, to itself what it does to the orders that came before it. 
So, since the bourgeoisie used reason to destroy the superstition before it, and since it must prevent itself uh, from becoming uh, superstitious, then it must use reason on itself to destroy itself. Its reason is basically to plan for its own destruction. The instrument by means of which the bourgeoisie had come to power, the unfettering of forces, universal freedom, uh, self-determination, determination, in short, enlightenment, turned against the bourgeoisie as soon as that class, as a system of rules, was forced to suppress those it ruled. So even the belief, uh, even even the beliefs that allowed it to form, uh, allowed it to uh, you know. To to form uh, must be uh, purged right away. So the radicality of enlightenment is that it applies even to itself what it applies to everyone else. And so this is the paradox of enlightenment. It is indeed anti-authoritarian since it dispels all forms of power pr prior to it as superstitious and therefore barbaric. Uh, the power of the priest or the magician or the shaman over, uh, over the ruled is destroyed by enlightenment. But at the same time, since it is power as well, it must be anti-authoritarian anti anti towards itself, so it destroys itself as well. Everything that it produced, the freedom that it produced, it must destroy it as well. And so it is, um, like in its fight against power, enlightenment uh, engenders all forms of absurd power. It's like in order to free people from power, all means are valid. We are, you know, willing to make the most oppressive structure in order to destroy any form of authority, even ourselves. You know, the, the war to end all wars kind of, uh, kind of shit. So the criticism of the aristocracy by the bourgeoisie was also an alliance between, uh, between the two classes, which means that eventually that alliance must crumble. Hence the planned chaos is the antithesis of enlightenment, and yet it is also enlightenment. Ultimately, the anti-authoritarian principle necessary, uh, necessarily becomes its own antithesis, the agency opposed to reason. Its abolition of all absolute ties allows power to decree and manipulate any ties which suits its, in, uh, its uh, purposes. So, in other words, anti-authoritarianism uh, anti becomes the justification of the most brutal authoritarianism. Authoritarian uh, principles, um, the principle trapped itself, uh, the anti-authoritarian principle trapped itself into condemning uh, contents uh, instead of forms, you know. For it, as long as we don't have any content, we cannot be authoritarian, because if I don't have any content, what am I imposing on you? And so, if the church doesn't postulate the existence of God, or if philosophy doesn't postulate the existence of morality, if nothing postulates truth, then we cannot be living under someone's authority. But then it means that the church would keep, on, would keep not only its oppressive structure, its form, but it can, do, uh, it can then do whatever it wants since there is no God, no morality, no objective truth to keep it in check. So we are talking hence of a nihilism uh, that only values forms. Whatever, uh, whatever, uh, whatever form works is the form that we follow even if it costs us our humanity. Reason becomes formalized uh, when we think it's just to maintain a form, not to reach a content, and so reason is prevented from reaching any meaning. With the formalization of reason, theory itself, if it seeks to be more than a cipher for neutral procedures, becomes an incomprehensible concept and thought is deemed, uh, is deemed uh, meaningful only after the sacrifice of meaning. So hence, enlightenment nullifies itself and even destroys its own progress, which sends you know, people back to antiquity. It's not you know, counter-enlightenment movements or ideas that send people back to the Middle Ages, it is enlightenment itself. Enlightenment becomes a battle, like we, uh, a battle, like we said, of people having to maintain the status quo, no matter how inhumane it is. Uh, the powerful must maintain their power, while the powerless must, uh, they must adapt uh, themselves to that power. And so in the end, reason is simply conformism to the dominant ideology, the dominant forms, the dominant process of production. So we are trapped in, all, uh, in an all-crushing machine that runs on its own, and no one dares to ask why. What is the point of this? And so skepticism which is the philosophy of enlightenment, 
to never take things for granted, to doubt what we learn from authority, to value experience and critical thinking, etc., this skepticism turns against itself. Whenever we think, we must abolish thought instantly in the name of skepticism. Everything, uh, like enlightenment tells you to doubt everything, including doubting. That is, that's how radical it is. And so in the end, you only have to resign yourself to the same dogmatism you were told to doubt. Just as Kant's moral philosophy set limits uh, to, uh, to his uh, enlightened critique in order to rescue the possibility of reason, unreflected enlight enlightened thinking has always sought for its own survival to cancel itself with skepticism in order to make room for the existing order. So in the end, enlightenment is actually holding on to an existing order, a status quo, and not at all to criticize or to think, you know, uh, or to think, uh, or to think for uh, for itself, or you know, freedom and all uh, and all of that and all of that uh, talk. Um, okay, so we are going to stop here for this first part of uh, of the excursus. There's going to be two other videos on the second on the second uh, excursus. Um, I hope that so far you are uh, well. You are enjoying this, and uh, it is uh, it is helpful. And as always, thanks for watching, and I will see you next week for the second.